I'm Mike Sheridan and you're very welcome to The Delve. Joel Domit is a comedian, podcaster, writer and former contestant on the reality TV series I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here. He is one of the many popular comedians playing the Vodafone Comedy Carnival in Galway from October 23rd until the 29th. Joel, thanks so much for coming in, man. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, you're, I know you're playing Galway. I mentioned it there at the top uh, as part of the festival, the Vodafone Festival yeah. in Galway. Are you one of those comedians that's come back and forth from Ireland over the years from the UK? A lot have. Yeah, I, I kind of have. I've, I mean, I was over this year as part of my tour and I did the Olympia uh, in Dublin and then um, and then I've always done, I've done bits and bobs of shows here. I, I used to come over and uh, and watch Tommy Tiernan at Vicar Street. So I used to like buy used to tickets. do like a hundred nights at Vicar Street. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I remember being. I, I was at. I was at the two hundredth show that he did at Vicar Street, and I so I flew over for that because I just was. I was fascinated to be in sort of his. I was obsessed with him when I was sort of. A, yeah, I still am, but a sort of a growing young comedian, and I used to come. Kind of, I'm fascinated with seeing him in his home environment, you know, and. Uh, I mean, obviously, as soon as you see him in Ireland, you, you just are saying so many references. I do not even slightly understand. He'd be like, you know, that tiny little village. And I'm like, no, I don't know that tiny little village. I have absolutely no idea what that is. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I've, I've been here. I've never done Galway, though. So yeah. I'm really excited. It's a nice part of the world. I heard it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, great crowds there as well. Yeah, I heard it's like, it's just strangely, there's a... There's a festival uh, in Wales called um, the Mac Comedy Festival, and um, and it's uh, I feel like it's a similar vibe. It's sort of grown from a tiny little boutique, beautiful festival with good acts, and grown into an amazing thing that every, acts love to go and see in a beautiful environment. And uh, it's uh, so yeah, I'm excited to I'm excited to do it. And what was it about Tommy Tiernan that appealed to you? Uh, was it his comedy? Because he's, he's more of a storyteller. He's not, yeah. he's not like a punchline comic. No, yeah, exactly. And he, he was, I, I think it was, he just was so, his stories are so good. I, I always was more interested in telling stories than doing sort of jokey joke jokes. And um, and my, my shows still now, if you sort of see my tour shows, they sort of have sweeping narratives and, and it's all like encased in one big story. And uh, so I just, I, I just thought he was one of the best storytellers out there. And, uh, and so, yeah, I just, I, I loved him. I thought he was absolutely great. And weirdly, I mean, nobody really, the less people know him in the UK. So it's kind of, uh, it's, it's always <laughs> when, you're, when you're younger, when, you know, when you, you feel like, you know something that other people don't. It also makes you like them more. You know, yeah. you're like, oh, I know a band that nobody knows here. I'm cooler than you. I liked yeah. Green. I like Green Day before they were big. It's like that sort of thing. Like, How many hipsters? Yeah, exactly. So I think I liked him for that as well. But uh, yeah, he's amazing. Uh, your comedy as well is you, you like you're you're quite personal on stage, but you're up for taking the piss out of yourself yeah. too. There was a really funny bit I watched of yours where you give the guy in the audience yeah. and he has to press the buzzer. And yeah. I thought that was brilliant Thank because you. it was already audience interaction, but you were more taking the piss out of yourself yeah. uh, than anything else. It's uh, genuinely my favourite joke I've ever written, <laughs> if you could consider it that. And I don't think I'm going to write one better in my life. <laughs> this, uh, if, if you don't know, it's a, uh, so basically I have a confetti cannon on stage. And then I um, give a button to an audience member and I say to him, uh, if this button sets off the cafe cannon, set it off when you think it's the right time in the show. And, um, and that button doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything at all. It's just a fake, it's actually a, a bike light, weirdly. <laughs> But um, you give it to him, and he's like, "Oh no!" And then the pressure, uh, the pressure. Yeah, yeah. And then I, um, and then I do this bit about it depends on the show, but I, uh, I do this, uh, later in the show. I'll, I say, oh, "Unfortunately, my mum, my mum uh, recently passed away," and uh, then the confetti cannon goes off, and the look on his face <laughs> is absolutely fantastic. It's just absolutely, and my mum's not passed away; she's absolutely fine. <laughs> It's absolutely fine. So I. Um, <laughs> so you're an actor as well. So you sell yeah. that moment really well. Yeah. So how, how did the audience generally react? Did they give it a couple of seconds before they laugh? Well, because what's an it's a, it's a fascinating laugh. As a as a comic, you you become obsessed with like, with the types of laugh you get, <laughs> and it's a fascinating one because the pop of the confetti cannon shocks them first of all. So they go, oh, oh, and then they laugh out of the the suspense and the, the, like the relief that they're, that they're not not being shot at. 
And so they're like, oh, 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 oh. And then they see the confetti and they're like, ah. And the laugh really goes for ages. And then all I have to do is like look at the person who I gave the button to. And then they laugh again. And then that laugh dies. And then I go, that was the wrong time. And then the laugh goes again. And then it goes back down. And, um, and then I sort of clear up, clear up all the confetti whilst just like looking at them. <laughs> And that's my favourite bit of the show. Just Not like, breaking eye contact. No, just looking at them, and then I just try and stuff it back in the confetti can and tube. And uh, yeah, it's my favourite bit. It's my favourite bit. It's such a stupid, so stupid. How do how do those people react? And do you just literally randomly pick somebody out the front to give? Yeah. Them to them? All you got to do is rand- basically pick someone who you don't think that they're going to be disruptive. Because genuinely, I've done a bit hundreds of times on tour, and only once, maybe twice, have I had someone go like, it's not working, it's not, the buzz not working. The buzz not working and it's just like, you have to be like, shut up. <laughs> you're, you're ruining, ruining it. Shut up. You're, you're ruining, ruining it for everybody. You're ruining the artistry of this bit. And um, uh, yeah, but otherwise, generally, they don't either, I say to them, I'm like, don't, uh, I'm gonna give you this button, press it when you think it's the right time in the show. Don't worry, you'll know when. And then generally they, and then I don't look at them. All I just do is don't look at them because then I don't want to look at them and then be like, oh, I didn't think yeah, it's the right time. They think time. that's their cue to press the button. Yeah, and the button doesn't do anything, so it doesn't <laughs> matter. It just uh, They would just press it. A lot of the time I'd speak to the people I've chosen after the show and they'll be like, oh, I was pressing it at this bit because I thought that was when it was supposed to go off, but nothing happened, <laughs> so I just left it. Um, so it's always interesting to find out when, when they thought was the right time in the show. But. And, and how do you judge when a show goes well? I ask this of all comedians because, yeah. you know, audi- audiences in different parts of the world are, are obviously going to be very different and react yeah. in different ways. So do you judge it on the beats that you hit, you know, uh, you in, know articulating the bits properly on stage or is it the audience reaction every time? And it's, it's interesting because audience reaction, um, your judgment of an audience reaction changes, I think. Uh, it's a very weird thing to say, but you've kind of got to reset your level after every show because, like, for instance, when you do Edinburgh Festival, you're doing the same show every day in that same room. And you may have a really good show and the audience's reaction is amazing, but then the next day you will be like, oh, I had a bad show today, but you're only basing it on the real audience's reaction of the last show, which was great. So you've got to go back and reset to nothing. And that's a very bad way of explaining it. But like, if you're doing a few shows during a day, yeah, and then you're kind of you, to bring yourself back down again before you go up on stage and start it from, exactly. the, start from the top. Exactly. And uh, yeah, don't. Uh, it, I just I do try to base it on the audience reaction, but it's also just about how much you're enjoying it. It's really interesting. I just did uh, my Netflix special in Montreal. Um, and it's a half-hour special that comes out next year, and you get two recordings of it in the same night, so you record it twice. And the first one, I didn't enjoy it. I was, like, nervous, I felt like I was all over the place, and um, it was quite a new set for me, so I was sort of finding my way in it a little bit. It came off and I was like, it's okay, I've got another one, it's gonna be fine. And then the second one, I enjoyed it so much, really felt freer, I enjoyed to play with the audience more, it was just like so much more fun. And I was like, great, that's the one. And they say you can take bits from both. And, uh, and uh, then they sent, you, they sent me both, and they said, oh, tell us which bit you want from which, which, which recording. And I was basically set on being like, oh, it's all from the second, it's gonna be fine. I watched them both and I was like, oh no, I'm so annoying when I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> I am so annoying, and uh, so I, I've taken it most of it from the first one, which is genuinely fine, because I'm just a bit more measured, whereas the second one I'm a bit more like, Because some comedians prefer having, some like having four or five shots at it, Yeah. Um, and then some prefer just to do it, like, okay, one, I'm going to get it in one, because I know if I have other opportunities to get it for the special, I'm going to be thinking that, and I might mess up. Yeah, I think uh, I did, I recorded my tour show, um, which is going to come out, later in the year after the Netflix special. And um, and I got one shot of that. And it was a mad thing where I'd just been re- recording a show called Joel and Nish versus the World, which which has been recording for like two months. And I'd been coming back, doing like a tour show and then going back to like, you know, we were in like Japan, Argentina, Peru, Tahiti, all these mad places. And after filming for two months, I came back and from Japan and the next day I was filming the special 
And I was like, I've never been so nervous in my life because I was like, I'm going to mess this up it's so bad. <laughs> Haven't done the tour show for so long. And, but that the adrenaline was great because it, I had one shot at it and I was nervous, but I knew the show. I did, by that point, I'd done it probably 130 times. It was like the end of a 130 day tour. So I just knew that show. And, um, and then, uh, yeah, and it was great. And it was, that's what you need. That little, sometimes you need that little bit of, little bit of nerves because otherwise you just kind of go on and you're like, meh. There's a kind of the unknown as well because you don't know the crowd, like, especially if you do the special in Montreal. Yeah. You're like, oh, ho hopefully the crowd are going to be on board here. They all have been on the yeah. tour so far. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's just that it's sort of, yeah, just got to have a good, you got to have a good crowd that are willing to, willing to enjoy themselves, which is, which I find actually in Ireland is always the case. Like people, a little bit too much sometimes. Sometimes a little <laughs> bit too much. The heckling here can get dark. But it's like, it's like you're out, but they understand the show. Like, they understand the, the craft of it, I think. You know, so because they've been watching, like, Tommy Tiernan for so many years, they understand the idea of comedy. And uh, uh, it's, they're the best crowds here. I find, like, here and Glasgow are, like, my favourite places to do gigs because they kind of, they give you that bit of energy and there's a little bit of, like chaotic sort of heckling every now and again but also they know exactly when to shut up so it's like it's 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 great like it's the perfect thing to keep a, a show exciting for the audience and for me how much practice does it take to deal with hecklers because when you're at a show and you're just like in the audience not even on stage yeah it's nerve-wracking it somebody's is just been a dick or somebody's had too much to drink it's it's also fine it's like you can't practice it i've, I've been doing comedy for like 10, almost 11 years, and so it's just part of it. And if you, if you were to practice, uh, if you had like a, a book of heckle put downs that you go through, <laughs> I think that would make it. Just one liners, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so it's too, that's too like, mm, too robotic. So I prefer, I, I don't know, I just deal with it in every situation, see what's, what's part of it. I don't, I don't sort of welcome it in any, in any regard, but I think it's always, it's always interesting. I think, I don't mind them. It's when they come from, a position of rudeness, that's when I don't like it. I, I, I love it when people will just shout something I, and you can see that look on their face where they didn't really see it coming out of their mouth. <laughs> you know, there's like, ah, ah. oh my God, I just said that. I kind of, oh, did I say that? I didn't I say that. And uh, whereas those ones where, even when you're like having a really good gig and someone just goes like, you're shit and you're not, they clearly don't think that. It's just coming from a place of like, they want the attention, which I fully understand. But it's just, it comes from a place of rudeness. I've been brought up as a nice lad. <laughs> My mum's taught me really nicely to be not rude and be very polite. And when someone's rude, it, it just annoys me. I, I do see red a little bit. I'm like, oh. And a lot of the time though as well, the audience gets annoyed. And the audience yeah. will turn on them for you. But that's yeah. also the best thing. There's nothing, there's no, genu genuinely, there's no better feeling in the world where the audience and you hate another audience <laughs> member. It's so good because it's just a win win situation. It's like the audience do it for you. You don't, you don't need to say anything because the audience has already turned on them. And it's great if the audience is, because if you're having a good gig and the audience is on your side and you're all against that guy, it's, it's easy pickings, it's fine. The worst thing is when you're having a bad gig and then someone shouts something because the audience aren't on your side and they agree with them. And that's when it's bad. And, you know, hopefully, fingers crossed, it doesn't happen much anymore. But that's the, that's, that's when it's difficult is when that bunch of people agree with when someone's like, you're shit. And the audience goes, you know what, actually, he probably is. That's actually a really good point. I hadn't thought about it until now. He is shit. Yeah, I agree with but that. You're, you're at the point now, though, where people are turning up for you. Yeah. You know, you're not going on as, as a headliner as part of a bunch of different shows. You're, you're basically on tour. Yeah. So the audience are already on board. And the assumption is that when you go there to play, they're there to see you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's fun. And it's, but it also what's the best thing about comedy is that you've got to go back into the clubs and you've got to do shows where you're not, where you, a lot of people won't know who you are and, You've got to do that because that's how you stay sharp and stay good. Otherwise, you just end up becoming a bit sort of flabby with it, really. And if you're too used to going out in front of your crowd and saying something that's fine and everyone laughs at it, you've... Uh, it's easy to get lazy. Yeah, you get lazy. So it's it's good just to go out and, and um, 
get into the clubs, but also tour and build up your ego a bit <laughs> because it's good to have well, the confidence. confidence. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's a huge thing on You've stage. You've got to have the confidence. Yeah. Um, and that's always genuinely been my my problem throughout being a, a comedian. I think my my confidence was always my bad, my, my bad point. I, I just... I didn't sell myself enough a lot of the time, and um, in terms well, of like hustling to get gigs, or when you were, I was fine getting gigs. It was just more about just pushing yourself out there when you're on stage and being like, "This is this is who I am, and this is the this is good enough." And uh, instead of sort of, yeah, I mean, everyone learns that as a comic. Slowly but surely, you go like, "I am right," and if you don't, <laughs> if you don't think this is good enough, then then you're wrong, and you've got to have that arrogance sometimes. Um, but then also sometimes you've got to go, maybe that isn't good enough. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, it's... You have to want to be as good as you can be every time as well. I yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a matter of what I love about it is that you're constantly, um, you're, you're, you're constantly sort of re-evaluating how good you are. So you, you go on tour and you're like, oh my God, this is the best I've ever been. I'm confident. I feel great. This is so much fun. And, and then you'll go back into a club and then people will be like, that, that bit wasn't good enough and you're like oh okay cool I need to be better than that and keeps you learning it's the way it's why it's why rock stars become idiots because people love them all the time the yes man around them all yeah, the time yeah constant people, people are, are like you're the best yeah. you're the best you're the best audiences are like I love that play that song play that song and they all sing along and I love that whereas like comedians just are constantly being told they're not quite good enough and they get bigged up and they're like, great, you're great, you're great, you're great. And then an audience will just be like, you're not good enough. <laughs> the humor is so subjective as well. Yeah. But when you get a call from Netflix to do a special, yeah. is that the holy grail now for comedians? Like back in yeah. the day in the US, it was Carson. Yeah. You did the, the Tonight Show. You did a set in the Tonight Show. Then you got a sitcom. Then you were rich. Totally. But now it seems to be Netflix have, have been so um, supportive of, of comics. It's with amazing. All the specials they've been launching. It's incredible to see. Yeah, it's so great. And it was, it was such an amazing thing to be a part of and and they're such an amazing company and so supportive the fact that they do two shows it just shows that they understand comedy because that's what you want you want to do a show after a show so that, that's because you want to leave that first one and go like oh, i wish i did that and then you can do it like it's it's perfect whereas most time you know if you like it's nothing, nothing bad about getting to live Apollo or anything like that. But when you do live the Apollo, you do one show, and that's your one chance of it. And if you mess it up, then it's you know they just try and sort it in the edit. But it's just so nice having two shots at it, and um, they're just really easy to work with, and they're really like they they consult you loads on the edit, and it's. Uh, it's mad. I love that they ask. Everybody them. says the same thing about Netflix. Even people that produce shows for them, that they get notes. Yeah. But a lot of the time, the notes are actually really helpful. Yeah. Which is crazy for executives. Yeah. You know, given what we would generally think of movie studios or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like people that work there really know comedy. It's really, it really helps. Um, and uh, I just, uh, yeah, I'm really excited to see it. It comes out early next year. Literally this morning, I just got sent. I think the almost the final edit of it. So. I'm gonna watch that. I think when I'm on my way to Galway after this. Lovely. And, uh, yeah, it's gonna be just sitting there laughing at yourself. Just sitting there laughing at myself. <laughs> oh, it's so horrible. I hate it. And my voice is so grating. I apologise. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I've, this is what I have to deal with all the time. It's such an such a frustrating voice. Um, and uh, I got I got a call the other day, and someone was like, "We would love you to do the voiceover of this show." And I was like, "Really? I mean, I really this voice? Like, I feel like." It's so much more annoying without my face. <laughs> how, mu well, how much has your life changed in the past couple of years? Because you were a known comedian for a long time. Like you said, you've been doing it for over a decade. Yeah. But then the only celeb thing happened and it just, like it does with anybody, it just zones in on you and there's this massive focus on you there. Yeah, it was nice because I was in that lucky position where I was sort of up and, I was an up and coming comedian. No real up and coming comedians have done that show. And so it was, uh, it was a big decision. We were like, is this going to be the end of everything? Are you going to throw away all the work you've been doing on the comedy circuit for so many years? And um, But it just really worked out going in that show. And uh, and it, was the, but the beautiful thing is, being a comedian, you have something to sell. Like, you have a vocation. Whereas a lot of people that do that show, they come out and they're like, well, hopefully maybe I could be a presenter if someone likes me. Whereas I came out and I was like, oh, I'm going to go on tour. They're going to keep going You're on gonna tour. You're going to keep doing what you do. Yeah, and so basically, I did it in 2016, and I finished the tour in June this year. And so I've been on tour ever since then, 
it kept on being extended, 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 and I, and I kept on getting other little jobs and bits and bobs along the way, and and so um, yeah, it's just been wonderful to me, and uh, and it's uh, the fact that I can do those a, pro a program that's very mainstream, and still being asked to do things like the Galway Comedy Carnival is, is amazing because that's like full of great acts and great comedians and people you've respected for years. And it's so nice to be asked to do a festival like that, but also being able to be on Celeb Juice, you know, and, yeah. and do shows like that. It's sort of bridging that gap. It's, it's been really fun. And what, what type of advice did you get when you were when you were going in? Because I can imagine people are like, look, you're not a narcissist, you're not a yeah. dickhead, you'll be fine. That's, yeah. That's the general advice. But then you don't know, it's not like a 24-hour feed, you don't know yeah. how stuff's going to be cut either. You don't. And actually, when the, the producers came to meet me before I went in, I had a couple of questions and I was like, I don't want to be portrayed as an idiot. And they rightly said, they were like, well, you can't be edited as an idiot if you're not an idiot. <laughs> And it's so true because people come out and they're like, oh, I was edited really badly. And you're like, well, you definitely said those things. So maybe if you didn't say those things, then you wouldn't have been portrayed as an idiot. And, uh, and often now, because I do the extra show, I, I've realized that you're only getting one slice of the pie. Like if they're being like a bit of an idiot on the show, usually it's because they're being a full on idiot a lot of the time. <laughs> and um, the... Yeah, so I, I went in and I was like, I don't, I, and they were, they said, you're, you're not going to be edited an idiot, idiot, you're not an idiot the entire time. And and uh, I was also worried about sleep. I was like, because I don't really sleep very well around people. And um, and they were like, trust us, it's the best sleep you're ever going to have. Just quite. And I was like, oh, okay. And um, it's honest, honestly the best. I will never sleep that well ever again because you're not having sugar, no coffee. You're not really eating many sort of uh, the sort of high carb foods, so it's just um, yeah, and you just you just sleep. Yeah, I, I remember you you go in your hammock and you close your eyes and you open your eyes and it's the morning. Like it's the most insane sleep <laughs> you'll ever have, and uh, and that's with like people snoring around you and like the the forest noises and stuff. And it's, possible tarantulas and snakes yeah. and shit. Well, I got out and there was this um, there was this video. Of, of this guy in full camouflage, like one of the sort of soldiers that sort of hold the perimeter, coming up when I was asleep, walking toward my hammock and grabbing a brown snake from underneath my, my hammock, which is apparently like the second most deadliest snake in the world or something, just holding up to the camera and just walking out. Imagine if I went to the toilet, I would have just stood in there and died. <laughs> and everyone seems fine with that. It's mental. So an Australian guy just casually walks or picks up the snake yeah, and is like, like yeah, this, this, could, this could kill all of us. It's the bad one. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, but I did this show called John Lynch vs. The World, which is all over the place and, and it's uh, basically visiting the fittest tribes in the world and trying to keep up with them for a week. Because you very much take care of yourself. You, you ran a marathon this year as yeah, well. That's yeah. not something that comics generally do. Jim Carrey said that comedians can't be in you know, too good shape. It's not funny. Yeah, I know. I'm trying my best to, <laughs> to go against Jim Carrey. I don't know. It's a terrible idea. But that was obviously just his idea because he's one of yeah. a wacky type comedian. Well, that's the thing. It's, uh, I think you, I don't know. For me, it's like a routine. I just kind of like... I like it because being a comic is like one day you're, you're doing this, one day you're doing that, and it's every day is so different. And if I've got that one thing that I try to do most days, it just makes my life so much easier. And I find that if I if I do if I go to the gym or whatever, then it just it makes my work ethic better. I write more. I I wrote a book uh, that came out at the start of this year, and um, and I I really found when I was like tight to deadlines. I tried like writing, waking up and writing all day, and I just would my head would wander. Or the stuff I was doing was like fine, whereas if I found if I woke up, went to the gym, and then started writing, the stuff would just flow out. Even though I was taking that extra hour away from writing, I would write so much more, and it was just that yeah, I just it's clarity of mind. It's I, just I don't fun. think people realize that about training, whether it's running, whether it's lifting weights, whatever it is, it can, yeah. it can be super therapeutic. Oh, it's great, and just like zen people out. For me, it's just a thing away from comedy because I'm, I'm obsessed with comedy and I love it and I'm and I I could talk about it all day and do it all day and I love doing gigs and I, I just love writing new shows and I love it
but they, for that hour or whatever, it's some. It's a moment where I don't look at my phone and I don't. I just do that. To do something else and concentrate on something else. I think it's always good to have a hobby, and that's kind of sad <laughs> as it is. That's my hobby. Oh god, I'm one of those guys. I hate myself. <laughs> Help myself so much. Uh, I know we have to let you go soon, but I want to know what's the most surreal moment you've had since, you know, well, I suppose in the last couple of years since you've mm. kind of found his broader fame. So was it was it Loose Women you did this year, and Sting was in the audience. That was insane. And Shaggy and Sting, which was a strange. Couple I mean, of, the, the maddest thing was finding out that they'd done an album together. Yeah. That was the maddest thing. Sting and Shaggy have done an album together, and I met them both, and I had a I had a photo with. Sting and I was weirdly I was really late that day, so I was uh, I that was stuck in traffic going across London, and then and they kept on calling and they were like, "Where are you? Where are you?" And I was, I was like, "We're stuck in traffic. We'll be there," and they were like, "You're gonna have to run straight in to this to the to the to this film that we're doing outside of the start of the show." I was like, "Okay, fine, fine, fine." And I arrived and it was right outside the television center of the BBC and it was on the sort of grass. And they were doing this sort of, they had these deck chairs set out with all of the people who present the Loose Women. And I, I, I arrived and I ran out of the car and they were like, Joel's here, Joel's here, Joel's here. And they'd like, this guy just put a microphone on me and go, 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 go. And I, I, I sat down in my seat and I was like, oh, they were like, hey, welcome to Loose Women. I just looked around and I was like, Shaggy was there and Sting was there. And I was like, what? What is this? What is this? And then this, they played this song. <laughs> I can't remember what song it was. It was just, they played this song. And, um, and like, it was like the intro song, it was like they played the song. And uh, I looked and Sting, and Sting just went, it's not one of mine. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> what? It's not one of his songs? And, uh, and I just hung out with, with, with Shaggy and Sting. Well, what, do, what a great two bunch of people. I was trying all day to get, I'm getting married next year, and I was like, oh, imagine if I could get them as the wedding band. <laughs> Shaggy and Sting, I don't really know. Do, do, do you do covers? You know, can you do Wilson Phillips? No, exactly. And Mrs. Loves Wilson Phillips, you do better hold on. Oh, I'd love to get that. It just, I just don't see them together. I listen to the album, it's so brilliant. It's just, you got, you got Sting just doing his, you know, message it, and then Shaggy does, yeah, go, da, 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 and you're like, what, what is this? It's so different, it's two completely different people. How yeah, does that happen? Was Sting's agent like the kids love the Shaggy? I, I Let, think let's let's get Shaggy on there. It was absolutely bizarre. What a decision! <laughs> what a decision to make. It's just two completely different people. Just, I mean, it's you know, it's fascinating. It's like it's like having watermelon in your salads. It, sometimes it works. Yeah, it's just it's like so strange. You like it just oh, comes together somehow. This is wonderful. But yeah, so that was a very that was a very surreal experience. Um, it's, uh, but it's, it's kind of full of surreal, weird, mad experiences now. You kind of, I think that's actually, I'm, we're planning the wedding for next year, me and my fiance, and, uh, and we're having a super small wedding that's like really low key and chill because we realize that people have weddings because that's their day and they spend so much money on this day because it makes people feel like a princess and it makes it's their day and it's just like spend loads of money on me and all of the people are looking at me and it's going to be amazing and we really we just don't want like a big thing because we realize that like in this weirdly in this in this line of work you feel like a princess every day <laughs> I feel like you a have princess. All of the constantly. attention all of the time. Exactly. Anyway. Look, there's lights and there's cameras. <laughs> People are asking me questions about myself. This is this is my wedding right now. This feels like my wedding. And so, on my wedding, I don't really. I want it just. I just want to have a meal with my family. I want to see my family because. You know, a wedding usually people don't really see their family because there's like 200 people there and they're like, I didn't really get to see anyone because I was just talking to everyone for 30 seconds. Whereas I want to talk to my family because I don't speak to them because I'm away being a princess in an <laughs> island. So what, I suppose, what's, what's the end goal? What, do you, what would you like? Would you like to just be a job and comedian, be working, selling out like you're doing now consistently? Would you, I know you've acted before, you've presented. Yeah. Well, generally that, that's the hard thing now is because you have to set yourself new goals because you, I've essentially, I know it's a very egotistical thing to say, but I've sort of surpassed my goals that I had as a comedian. You know, that's, that was my dream when I was, when I started out was to like to tour, to do the Hammersmith Apollo, to, to be able to come to Dublin and do, do the Olympia, you know, that, that's a, the dream. And the, the fact that I did that and, you know, to have a Netflix special, that, that's, 
that's all that I ever would have wanted. And so now you've got to set yourself goals. And the mad thing is that you've got to set ridiculous ones because they might happen. Because setting a Netflix goal, uh, the doc, the setting itself having a Netflix special, that's a ridiculous goal. And the fact that I've done it is amazing. And so now I've got to, you've got to go, okay, I'm going to do this, I want to do this. And so now I just, I just want to, I want to make sure that I, I sort of, I want to always be a comedian. I want, I love doing that. I want to keep touring. I just want to keep making stuff that I really love and really can stand by. And I keep writing shows. And I, again, to bring it back to Tommy is such a perfect example of someone who's, his integrity has remained throughout and he just still makes incredible shows. And it's, if I could keep doing shows that people like and, and um, hopefully not, Sell out every now and again, but not sell out too much. As in, as in well, sell out the venues, but not sell out my soul. <laughs> you know, but, we do um, like Daz ads or something. Exactly, yeah. and you can do those every now and again, but you just gotta. Yeah, I just, I just want to be happy. I think I'm one of the only happy comedians. <laughs> That's what everyone seems to say about me. When they meet me, they're like, oh, you're genuinely a happy person. I thought you were all neurotic messes. How did this happen? Yeah, yeah. it's. Uh, I genuinely am very happy, and so, you know, hopefully that. That remains. I think that's that's what I uh, that's my goal. is just to keep to keep happy and and um, not become a sort of a depressed sellout. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good goal. It's a pretty simple goal. When is the Netflix special going to be coming out? Do you think, or do you know? Yet? Next year. Uh, they haven't set a date for it yet, but um, but yeah, and I'm I'm pretty happy with it as well because I I'd record my my tour show and so and which is then going to come out next year later. So I had to delay that because of the Netflix one. So I had to, I had to write a new show for the Netflix one. And so that was, I got it together pretty, pretty quickly. And I was really proud of how, how I got it together. And, and it was, yeah, I'm happy with it, I think. Looking forward to seeing it. Yeah, man, it's gonna be, it's gonna be fun. I'm really looking forward to doing Galway. Like everyone says it's absolutely beautiful. We, we always strive more with the lowered expectations, I think, more than anything else. It's like, it's going to be raining, first of it's all, going to be raining. but yeah, you will, you will have a good time. I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. And it's, uh, it's beautiful. That's what I love about Ireland is that it's, it's beautiful even in the rain. It's like, it, it's raining, but you're like, oh, this is fantastic somehow. There's something about like, <laughs> like London is so depressing in the rain. You're just like, oh, get me out of here. Get hit in the face with umbrellas and elbows. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's horrible. But here, you're just kind of, you just want to stand out in the rain like Shawshank and just take it all in, you know? <laughs> Leave it there, Joel. Thanks so much it's for coming. It's a pleasure. In, Thank you very much for having me.